Welcome to the D-Spot Podcast. Dr. Dana McNeil is a licensed marriage and family therapist who specializes in working with couples using the Gottman Method. Her evidence-based practice provides support for the wide range of relationship issues that modern couples face. By using her open, affirming, and outside-of-the-box thinking, Dr. Dana is able to approach her work with couples by bringing both insights and tools that reflect the realities of today's complicated relationships. Dr. Dana features guests on her podcast that include a unique array of celebrities, CEOs, influencers, and everyday folks who are all working on navigating new conversations about how society views what goes into a successful relationship. And now, here's your host, Dr. Dana McNeil. Hello, and welcome to the D-Spot podcast. I am Dr. Dana McNeil, and I'm your host for a podcast that is all about relationships and people in them. Our goal in this show is to change the conversation about going to couples therapy and explore what defines a healthy relationship. Today, I am excited to be in conversation with the host of the Sage Money Conversations, my friend, Barbara Norman. I'm so glad that you're here. Thanks for having me on, Dana. I love your show. I love what you're doing. And um, I'm excited to talk about money. (laughs) Yes, because you know, clients are coming to my office having arguments about money. And I'm helping them with the conflict, but then I got to refer them to you because I don't know anything about money other than how to spend it. So (laughs) what are you seeing when they come to you? What are couples in crisis about financially? So a couple of things. I would say the first thing is how do we spend money? And I think that being in a relationship, we should not have secrets about money, but I do think we should have privacy around money. And so I always recommend a yours, mine, and ours checking account. The ours is where we pay our bills. That's the house payment, the, the um, groceries, it's everything. But on the side, we each need to have our allowance or our spending money, if you will. And I think that's where people should have their own separate checking accounts. And even if, um, let's say that one person makes more than the other, they still should have the same amount going into their checking account every month. Mm. And so if the guy wants to go and drop a thousand bucks on a playoff game, the wife's not complaining. Mm. If the wife wants to buy buy a $400 pair of jeans that make her butt look good, there's no criticism. So you get privacy, but you're not keeping secrets from each other. And I think keeping that autonomy and not having to justify our every spending is um, every couple needs to do that. I like that. I already do that. So I feel like I'm in good standing with you today. I don't, and also on the other side, I don't need my partner knowing how much I spend on their birthday present. Right. Because then they're going to be like, you shouldn't have spent that much money. It's like, but I wanted to, and it was out of my fun. So just enjoy. Yeah. Right? And that's so, true. Yeah. We need to have that sense of identity, but then also, so how do we have conversations about the part that goes into our mutual account? And I think that's where we can get into trouble. So let's take, for example, going out to dinner. And let's say that the husband comes from a family where there wasn't a lot of money and they were kind of always in survival mode. He goes out to dinner and it's like, you know what, one glass of wine, entree, we're out of here, where the wife may have come from a family where there was a lot of money and they love food and there was enjoyment. And it's like entrees, salads, um, appetizers, desserts, drinks, you know, she wants to do it all. And so there's conflict around those kinds of things. And I think, you know, coming into your office and first of all, most of the time, I think that these are irrational arguments, um, irrational in that they both come from a different place. They both have money beliefs and probably some money baggage. And so I think, you know, getting into your office and discussing, first of all, what is feasible? We need to have a discussion around what is the budget for going out to dinner? But then we also need to talk about what are those, what's that baggage? What are those beliefs that we're coming into? Because if we can afford to do the things that we want to do and really go out and enjoy that meal, but someone's not enjoying it because of the cost, well, then we need to start talking about what is the underlying belief and issues that's holding us back from joy. So first budget, second baggage, let's put that together, have those conversations. And then two, I think before you go out to dinner the next time is have a discussion beforehand as Mm. to rather than waiting till you get in the restaurant and getting carried away with an argument, have the discussion beforehand and do baby steps into working into a new behavior. And so I think that kind of thing helps a lot. 
helpful because sometimes it's not about the money. It's what the money represents. And the money becomes a vehicle for conversations that couples are not having, right? Mm -hmm. Or about power and influence and who gets to have power and influence. And so that kind of leads me into a question. How do you tell couples to handle it when maybe one of us has decided to step out of the job world and we're a stay-at-home parent, right? And we don't feel as if our partner recognizes what we bring to the relationship and that they're, how do we talk about money when we're both not bringing the same amount of money into the relationship? Well, see, and that's sad because what that tells me is money defines our value. Ah. That hurts. That's really, really hurtful. We each come into a relationship with our own unique abilities and personalities and the way we love each other, the way we love our children. It's not about the money for heaven's sakes. And if you're not making money and you're not being valued, boy, there is something really wrong there. I love that. I like this idea that, you know, there are the intangibles that somebody brings to a relationship that is just as valuable as the dollar signs that they bring into their relationship. And if we're, we have bigger problems, if we're not seeing the value of what somebody does for us versus how much financially they bring to us. Right. And maybe is there some resentment that I'm doing all the work and you're not? So maybe that's the issue that needs to be addressed. Um, you know, is the working person not having enough fun? And what do we have to do to create joy? So I think there's way bigger issues when that becomes the discussion. So you may not know the answer to this. I may be putting you on the spot. How does a partner talk to the partner that wants to spend a lot more money than they do. Like, how do you have a conversation about that? How do you point that out without somebody having their feelings hurt or it coming across like I'm just being logistically having a conversation about our spending habits? Okay, so in my office, there's kind of two tools that I use. One is calculator-based and one is joy-based, if you will. Okay. um, I always like to start with what is the budget and also a financial plan. So in a financial plan, we're going to sit down and we're going to say, what do we have to do to retire? What do we have to do to, if we want to move to another state, if we want to put kids through college. So we get this financial plan going and then we'll have like four side-by-side scenarios that says, well, if I want to retire early or if we want to spend more on vacations. So we put four side-by-side scenarios and then we start talking about the numbers and hopefully we can get some agreement as to which of those four do we like the best. And they're always changing and that's okay. But then what we'll do is we'll go to kind of that joy part of the planning. And I believe every financial plan should have fun and joy planned into it. Um, If I have to talk one more time about what is the calculation for retirement and this it's you take away my belts and shoelaces we got to have fun and so (laughs) i'll pull out um, like a wheel of life and each couple gets their own questionnaires and they're going to rank their wheel as to here's you know relationship community so they're going to rank all these places in their life and maybe one they'll rank really high and one they'll rank low it's a wheel. And if they have a flat tire or a deflated tire, what do we have to do to make that tire full? And so they each get to talk about those areas in their life where they're not feeling a lot of joy or where they feel they want improvement. Sometimes it has nothing to do with money at all, Dana, but sometimes it does. And so maybe that's got to get put into the budget. And so we kind of want to talk about what brings joy to Good. Great. I love all of this. Okay. You and I talk about, I always say it wrong, the five F's. Tell me about that. Five F words um, in financial planning. So let's do the first one. My favorite one, friends and family. Um, I can't even begin to tell you over the course of my career, how many times I get a call, my son-in-law said this, my brother-in-law said this, and they've got this harebrained scheme for investing in something. And Dana, my family is no different. I'll remember back to the late 90s, my brother, who's a CPA, we all thought Quentin was the be all end all. He was so high on a pedestal Mm -hmm. and he comes to us with global crossings and we got to invest in global crossings. They're They're laying fiber optic cables across the ocean floor for the internet. Okay, sounds good. Right? (laughs) (laughs) And I said, I aren't they putting satellites in the air for that? Isn't the ocean kind of corrosive? Uh, uh, And uh, anyways, this is sad. I haven't done the numbers. My younger brother put all of his money from the sale of a house into it, $50,000. 
lost it all. Oh no. Um, I put my Roth money in it. And when it was half, I called my brother. I said, Quentin, are you sure about this? And he said, oh yeah, I sit on the board, do it. I lost all of it. Um, I bet that 56,000, if I put it in the S&P 500, would probably be worth over a quarter of a million dollars today. So if friends and family come to you with this harebrained scream, don't do it. Honestly, go, everybody fly to Hawaii, get the best house you can. The dysfunction and the stories are going to have way less resentment if you go on vacation rather than if you do that stupid idea. So just a straight out, if something doesn't sound good, even if it's from Uncle Charlie, who always has good ideas and drives a Mercedes, I should probably just say no. I should trust my instinct. Trust your gut. Run it by your advisor, but trust your gut. So stay away from friends and family. That's my first F. Okay. The second Great F tip is, noted. <laughs> noted. The second F is fees, which is I people don't pay attention to fees in their investments. And I have a beef with my industry. It lacks transparency. It's super complex, but fees can eat away at your returns so fast. Mm. And so pay attention to fees. And we can talk more about this. Um, In fact, I'm going to be doing a podcast on it later today. Investing 101. And so if you want to jump over to Sage Money Conversations and hear about fees, you can hear about fees, Um, but pay attention to fees. They're important. The third F is fiduciary. So what does that mean? Um, In my business, people work on commission and they work as fiduciaries. So Hmm. one of my big beefs, Dana, do you know what the education level is to be a financial advisor? You have to be smart and better at math than I am. You have to have a high school education and pass two tests and that's it. Wow. Okay. So there's no like licensing or any kind of there's licensing right there's licensing there's continued education but it doesn't have to say that you're smart and there's a lot of people who are charismatic and not smart and so if you are working with someone who is um an advisor you could be paying a commission and again we are complex we are not transparent if you get your statement and you just paid a commission there is no line item that says you just paid a commission oh I used to work as a commission person. When I first came into this industry, that was the only way that we worked. And the sad thing was um, when I worked on commission, I'd take in a client, I'd get paid a nice commission. The next month I'd take on another client, get a paid a commission in the third month, but I never got paid to go back and service those clients, oh. which is really sad because investments are changing. Your life is changing. So when you're working with a commission person, they only have to know that this investment is right for you at the time of purchase. It doesn't have to be ongoing. Just right. So they're not the annually like, let me check in on what's going on for Barbara and what's her life yep. like and how old is she right now and what does she need? Exactly. You're not going to get that. When you work with a fiduciary, it's fully transparent. You see the fee. Like I charge 1% for ongoing management, 1% per year, yeah. but people see it. They know what I'm getting paid. They can probably figure out how many dollars per hour that we're spending together and what I'm getting paid. And it's scary, but it's the devil, you know, versus the devil you don't know. But a fiduciary has to make sure that the investments are suitable for you at all times. Gotcha. We have to ongoing show that we are um, doing the right thing for our client. So work with a fiduciary. And I will tell you, Dana, buyer beware, there are hybrid investors, hybrid advisors out there who work on both commission and who do fiduciary. Stick with a fiduciary only. Noted. Another F word to keep in mind. So fourth F word. <laughs> Forgive yourself. There's going to be bad investments. There's going to be bad markets. They happen. Forgive yourself. Move on. And the fifth- or send them to my office if they can't, because <laughs> that is going to be something that creates resentment. And having the tools to do the moving on can sometimes get couples stuck, right? But great. Yeah. Very sage advice. Okay. It's it's not going to be perfect all the time. And you look at like our market, we've had a bloodbath for the last three trading days and um, people react emotionally. Hopefully they're not doing that now, but we got to forgive ourselves, and we can't keep it, keep us from moving forward investing because that's a bad, bad mistake. Okay. And my fifth one, which we've talked about is fun. Make sure you put fun into your financial planning because 
I don't want to get to the end of my life and say, gee, I wish I would have. So let's make sure we're getting fun every year into that plan and doing things with our life, doing things with our money. Great. Those are awesome. I like that they're F words that are (laughs) podcast friendly. Thank you. Thank you for that. (laughs) I think that's important because so many of my clients that come in and are having issues in their relationship, they're not even talking about their budget. Like, I mean, they're not getting to the F's. They don't even know how much they make. They let one person be in charge of everything. And then they resent later if things don't go well. And the person who's in charge of everything feels resentful themselves that they're making all of the decisions. And so a financial planner kind of lets that one person that maybe is in somewhat in charge not feel like they're shouldering all of it themselves. And are you kind of encouraging the other partner that's been standing off to the side to engage age as well? Oh, totally. We've both got to be on board with it. And I think one of the greatest tools that we can use in a situation like this, Dana, is, sorry, a paper calendar, if they still exist, but they do, I use them. (laughs) Yay. I still think paper calendars are huge. So what I would do in this situation is we've got every month bills that we have to pay, right? And then there's what's left. Hopefully there's a positive number and that's discretionary income. So let's go to the calendar and let's put our fun, our monthly fun in the calendar. Like Growing up for my kids, oh, I love this story. Um, I was a single mom. I didn't have a lot of money, but every Friday night we had a floor party. And I think my floor party cost me a buck 50. We would go to Blockbuster Video for 99 cents, write a video. I'd take my kids over to 7-Eleven and they could get five off the bottom. So five pieces of candy for five cents <laughs> each. We'd go home and we would just lay pillows and blankets all over the Aww. floor. We'd have a floor party. So, but that was on the calendar. I knew what it cost. Sunday night dinners, no cost everybody's home. This is a tradition. We're doing it. But then if there was tires, I'd put it on the calendar. Like I got to buy tires this month. And so on the 15th, and so the kids would see, oh, mom's a little stressed. I know not to ask. But then if there was a birthday party, it's like, okay, we got my mom's birthday party. This is what we're going to spend on my mom. Um, You guys want to go to Disneyland. Ah, We can't do it. But if we save our money three months from now, we can go to Disneyland. And so put those events on the calendar, put a dollar amount on it so that when you come up on a Friday night and you're tired, you're not slapping a credit card down for dinner. You're, you know what your budget is yeah. and you've got your family traditions on there. And so now we're building meaning into that paper calendar. I think that's awesome. These are wonderful, wonderful, helpful tips for couples that have no idea where to start, what to do, where to turn. What other tips do you have? Do you have anything else that couples should keep in mind as they're either heading towards retirement or planning for their empty nest part of life? Is there something that they should be thinking about? No, heading towards retirement, hopefully you have not put off your retirement savings till now, but heading into retirement, I would say, again, I'm, I'm a big on the fifth F word fun. Um, don't save it all for retirement. I've seen too many people who don't get to retirement or they're disabled or something else happens. If you're an empty nester, you've got to reconnect with who you are as a couple. I think we get so busy with the planning part of our kids that we forget who we are. Keep connecting with each other. Keep investing that time into each other and creating special times again. Re- refresh who you are. What I love most about you is not only your infectious spirit, but your ability to talk about money in a way that's approachable, that doesn't feel scary, and that you use the word fun about something that's so serious. <laughs> and I, I'm so appreciative that you were willing to come on and share these tips and give some like insight and expertise for this thing that is so scary for all of us and is so fraught with emotions and expectations and family of origin baggage. So I think you did a really beautiful job of kind of summarizing all those scary parts of money. And I I really appreciate you giving us the time to come and and be here with us. Oh, well, you're welcome. If you can do the money baggage, I'll do the money fun. (laughs) How can people who are listening learn more about you or for your find your podcast or come check out your stuff? So my podcast is Sage Money Conversations and my website, Sage Path Solutions. So um, we have a learning tab. You can come on and learn more. I do lots of teaching around town. I have my Women's Financial Academy where people can learn more. So um, Sage Path Solutions, uh, contact me. Let's talk about how you can have fun with your planning and let's do some of those fun worksheets together. Thank you so much, Barbara. This has been great.
Yeah, thank you. This has been the D-Spot Podcast with Dr. Dana McNeil. To learn more about Dr. Dana's practice, simply visit us at https colon slash slash Dana McNeil.com. Simply visit us at www.danamcneil.com.